For conservation of momentum problems, the first thing you have to decide is whether or not momentum is actually conserved. So momentum is conserved only if the net external force acting on the system is zero. If we have collisions, as long as the force between the objects that are colliding are much larger than any external forces, and, it, and we're looking at a very short time frame, then we can also look at conservation momentum also. But it, again, it's very important to know when you can look at conservation of momentum. If you don't have the net external force being zero, you cannot use conservation of momentum. And it all depends on how you set up your system. If you're looking at a baseball colliding with a baseball bat, if you look at just the baseball, then the bat is an external force and the momentum of the baseball itself is changing. If you look at the ball and the bat together as your system, then the force of the bat and the ball and the ball and the bat are both internal forces. And although the momentum of the ball and the momentum of the bat both change, the total momentum of the system does not. So whether you can use conservation of momentum or not depends all on how you pick your system. So you have to define a coordinate system. You can set up your x and y axis. Treat each object as a particle. Something that's really important to do is draw before and after sketches and include vectors to represent the velocities. Make sure that you're paying attention to what direction the velocity is going. If you're looking at one dimensional motion, a velocity in one direction will be positive, a velocity in the other direction will be negative. You'll want to label which is your positive or negative direction. That's extremely important because the most common mistake that people make is forgetting to make velocities if one is to the right and one is to the left, making one of those velocities negative. Um, label your vectors with magnitudes, angles if you have something in two dimensions, draw your x and y components or whatever information is given. Um, give each unknown magnitude, angle, or component a symbol. Um, you might choose the subscripts one and two or initial and final for the velocities before and after the collision. And then figure out what you're trying to solve for. And then set up the momentum equations for the x direction and the momentum equation the momentum equations for the y direction for each object add together all of your initial x components of your momentum to get the total initial x momentum add up all of your y components to get your initial total y momentum those together will give you your total initial momentum and then you'll do the same thing for the final x and y components of the velocities and momentums. Again, remember that you're adding vectors together, so you don't add x components and y components together in the same equation. Um, you need to make sure that you're being careful with your signs. And then you need to use your conservation of momentum equations to solve for whatever's being asked for. Sometimes you'll convert the x and y components of the velocity or the momentum to its magnitude and direction. Sometimes all you're going to have is just an x a momentum in the x direction or just a momentum in the y direction. And in some problems, energy considerations give additional relationships among the various velocities. And that happens for elastic collisions, where there's the extra requirement that the kinetic energy of the system stays constant. And then does your answer make physical sense? If you're looking for momentum, check to see that the direction of momentum is reasonable. Again, the direction of the final momentum must be the same as the direction of the initial momentum. So just look at all of your objects to see if everything agrees with what it should be. So in this example problem, there's an astronaut that's sitting at rest, holding an oxygen tank. It's also at rest. The astronaut is sitting there. He's outside the space station. The cord to pull himself back into the space station broke. And so he's stuck. So he takes off his oxygen tank. Initially, both the astronaut and the oxygen tank are at rest. So the initial momentum of the system is the momentum of the man plus the momentum of the tank. But both of them are not moving, so they're both zero. And so he throws the tank away from him, and this causes him to move back in the opposite direction. Again, 
This comes from Newton's third law. If he pushes on the oxygen tank to the right, then the oxygen tank pushes back on him to the left, sends him backwards. And so the final momentum of the system is his mass, 80 kilograms, times his velocity, plus the mass of the oxygen tank, 10 kilograms, times its velocity of 2 meters per second. And then from the fact that the initial momentum has to equal the final momentum, I have that the initial momentum of 0 has to equal 80 V plus 10 times 2. Or you get that the velocity of the astronaut is negative 20 over 80 or negative 0.25 meters per second. Now, in setting this up, even though I knew that the velocity of the astronaut was to the left, I could have gone through and I could have made that velocity negative. Um, if I set it up, if I just make that velocity positive, if it's supposed to be negative, it will work out to be negative in the algebra. So from this, I could have said that since I know that the initial momentum is zero, I could have set the momentum of the oxygen tank equal to the momentum of the astronaut, because I know that they're going to be equal, once to the right, once to the left. When I subtract the one over, I'm going to just have those two momentum vectors equal to each other. And I could have solved for it and just gotten 0.25 meters per second, and just known that it was to the left. But again, setting it up this way, if I let my variable v be positive, if it's supposed to be negative, it does work out to be negative in the end. And again, we looked at this problem in class. We had the 0 0.05 kilogram arrow fired at 30 meters per second, and we had the melon sitting on the man's head. And so it was a bald man with his head polished, so that way there was no friction. Um, so it was completely frictionless. That way we don't have any net external forces as the arrow was ripping through the melon. The only net force we have on the system or the net force we have in the system is zero. We have the arrow on the melon and the melon on the arrow, but those are both internal forces. So if I look at the initial momentum of the arrow, which is 1.5 kilogram meters per second, plus the initial momentum of the melon, which is zero, then that's going to have to equal the final momentum of the melon plus the final momentum of the arrow. And if I set my initial momentum equal to my final momentum, I can go through and solve for the unknown velocity of the melon. So again, we set the initial momentum of 1.5 equal to the momentum of the arrow afterwards. 0.05 times 18 was 0.9, plus the momentum of the melon, which was 2 kilograms times V. So solving for the unknown velocity of the melon, we got 0.3 meters per second. It doesn't go flying off the man's head, but it does, it's definitely going to fall off of his head. So again, whether the, you have two objects that stick together, or whether you have one object moving and it bounces off and the other object bounces off the other way, or whether you know that one of the velocities is zero. Somehow in all these problems, we've been given one of the velocities after the collision and we're looking for the other one. We'll see that this is different when we get to elastic collisions. For elastic collisions, they don't give us this extra piece of information. Here we had the extra information that the arrow was moving at 18 meters per second after the collision. Um, for elastic collisions, there was a little bit less that they gave us and we use an extra requirement. The final example problem that I wanted to look at, that we didn't look at in class, was this bullet that was passing through this block. The bullet has a mass of 0 0.001 kilograms. It's moving at 100 meters per second initially. So the first thing is to calculate the initial momentum of the system. So the initial momentum is going to be the momentum of the bullet, which is 0 0.001 kilograms times 100 meters per second, plus the momentum of the block, which is 5 kilograms. It's not moving, so I really don't need to include that term. But I get an initial momentum of 0.1 kilogram meters per second.
And then after this collision, I have that the final momentum is going to be the momentum of the bullet, which is 0 0.001 kilograms times 20 meters per second, because that's the velocity of the bullet after it passes out of the block, plus 5 kilograms times the unknown velocity of the block. And so since the initial momentum equals the final momentum, I have that 0.1 is going to equal 0 0.001 times 20 is 0 0.02 plus 5v. As I solve that for the velocity of the block after the bullet passes through, I get that the block is moving pretty slowly. It's moving at 0 0.016 meters per second. Again, this is a fairly massive block. It's a pretty light bullet. We would get a larger velocity if the block was made of styrofoam, so it was a lot lighter, or if the bullet was much more massive. So again, after this, we have that the block is moving to the right at 0 0.016 meters per second. And so then to go through and solve for this distance, we can use work and energy. So if I look at the block, the block has a mass of 5 kilograms. It has a weight of 49 newtons. It's on a flat surface, so the normal force is also going to be 49 newtons. And this force of friction is going to be the coefficient of friction, which is 0.2 times 49 newtons, the normal force. So we get that the force of friction is 9.8 newtons. And so we're going to solve for this using work and energy. It's also possible that you could find the acceleration of the block, use that acceleration with kinematics to find the distance that it slides. I think it's a little bit easier to solve for this distance using work and energy. So if I do that, and the change in kinetic energy of the block is its final kinetic energy minus its initial kinetic energy. Again, this initial kinetic energy is the kinetic energy that it has after the bullet has ripped through. So the moment we're looking at the conservation momentum piece first, and then we're looking at this energy piece second. So this is zero minus a half times five kilograms times 0 0.016 squared, which is negative 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4 joules. So the change in kinetic energy of the block equals the net work, which is the work done by friction, which the work done by friction, again, it's going to be negative, and it's going to be the force of kinetic friction times the distance. So if I make the substitutions, I have negative 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4 joules equals negative, the force of friction was 9.8 newtons times d. And if I solve for d, I get 6.5 times 10 to the negative 5 meters. Because this block is not moving very fast at all, it barely slides at all to the right. But again, depending on what my mass of my block was, what the velocity of my bullet was, how fast the bullet comes out the other side, those are all going to be things that affect what this answer is. Again, a lot of conservation of momentum problems that we're going to look at are going to have a conservation of momentum piece, and then you're going to go through and you're going to use other information. You're going to look at other things like conservation of energy, work, a lot of other possible things.